Yes, yeah, so I don't know if you want that or I guess I do. Yeah, it does not need it. was probably an IT department. Because I had that was full. So, no, it's not what it really is. It was, that it was a huge <laughs> 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 so let's uh, get started. Uh, so let's get started. Okay, just uh, some reminders. Uh, we've got Simon number four, if you choose to do it. Uh, he's due on Monday, so that's lecture 11, right? Um, Simon number one, hopefully you've started working on it. And actually, a number of you have made appointments to see me. It's a good idea, because I can give you advice that might uh, save you uh, a lot of work on that. So if you haven't seen me yet, it's probably a good idea. And that's, uh, of course, the last lecture, where everybody will have um, approximately 10 minutes to present. Assignment number five, what's posted on the website is last year's assignment number five. And that will be, a new version of that will be posted, uh, and a different version uh, will be posted the last lecture. Okay, so uh, basically at one o'clock uh, on Thursday, the 12th lecture, I will post that. And then um, the assignment is individual, will be based, um, I guess, I'll put uh, about 30 hours on it. If you take a look at the, uh, the old version, you'll see that it's um, just five questions, no more than two pages of writing. Okay. Best way to review for the last assignment is simply to look at some of the videos. And I think almost all the videos are operational now. Okay. Any, uh, any questions? Uh, there's uh, lots of handouts today, and it will be useful to actually uh, flip through those handouts because um, the, the print is very small, and it's going to be difficult to see it on the overhead. Uh, webcast students, um, I sent you, I guess, five or six PDF files with all of the, the handouts uh, from today. Okay, let's, uh, let's get going. Um, we're now going to talk about stock selection. And uh, for me, in terms of uh, this course, um, you have to think about what you can actually add in terms of performance. So, so how can we add so-called alpha? There's many different ways to, to think about actually doing that. So one way, uh, and what we call kind of like the baseline, was to simply index to some known quantity like uh, the MSCI um, you know, world index. We're not going to add any alpha if we do that. Nothing. Second way is to take some strategic bets, which means kind of longer term weighting that deviates from the Morgan Stanley Capital International uh, <coughs> world index. So you strategically overweight uh, certain countries, and you could do this on a sector basis also. Uh, it doesn't make any difference, but this potentially could lead to some, some alpha, and alpha being defined as performance over and above the benchmark. The third way um, we talked about was a tactical asset allocation. So it'd be short-term bets where we're using our forecasting models like an assignment, uh, assignment number two and three and four, we're using our tactical models, and we'll take short-term deviations from the strategic weights. Okay. There's another level here, and that has to do with the selection of the, of the actual index components. So suppose that we decide that um, we're going to tactically overweight the UK. Well, how do we actually do that? To actually implement that, um, you need a mechanism. 
And one mechanism might be that you're already <coughs> invested in UK equities and a broadly diversified portfolio, and you increase the UK weight by trading on the futures. So you can increase the weight effectively without transacting in the, in the individual equities. So we're going to tactically tilt towards the UK. We can basically just buy uh, some futures contracts to do that. And that will effectively overweight us. And I guess we have to underweight uh, some other uh, countries also. But the real question here is, um, that's kind of like indexing, right? Because we're just buying, you know, um, whatever index in the UK. So is it the case that that's, that's the best we can do by buying an index? It's almost like throwing us back to the very first situation where we just buy the tracking portfolio. So do we simply go for the index or do we try to do something better? And that's where stock selection or asset selection actually comes in. What I want to do over the next uh, couple of days is to go into some detail as, a, as to how to implement a system like that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we will always keep track of the benchmark within a particular country. But what we're going to try to do is to pick securities that will outperform that benchmark and securities that will underperform also. Okay. Now, this leads to some potential problems. Okay, and let's, let's try to think of those up front. So to do the the benchmark allocation is easy, right? The example of the MSCI World Portfolio, it's simple. Figure out what the weights are, it's published by MSCI, and then basically just invest according to those weights and then just update um, uh, accordingly as stocks go in and out. That's easy. Strategic forecasting, that's not so easy. You found that out on assignment number two. But it's implementable. And we're going to implement on indices. Tactical forecasting, well, that's, that's, uh, that's difficult. But some people had just amazing success in assignment number three. I do have this log of all of the uh, predictive models that I will, um, I, I guess I'll give that out um, by email. Some of them very impressive. But again, we're working with indices. Now we're working with the individual securities. And the following potential problem arises. Suppose that you're looking and you're doing your tactical uh, exercise. And uh, let's, let's abstract from the strategic exercise, purely tactical. And our model suggests that the portfolio of French equities is going to <coughs> underperform. Okay, so we're forecasting with a model like we developed in assignment number three. In France, uh, we get, uh, for the MSCI um, France, we get a negative uh, forecast of return. Okay. So does that mean that we actually um, underweight France? Is there a situation where we would uh, override our forecast? But, Say we've checked our model, you know, it's fairly robust, got a sample, get a negative excess return for France. What do we do? Envious? The one thing we don't do is to sell all the individual equities, as I said, we want to transact uh, on the futures market. But is there any other situation where we would maybe um, not do that? Yes. Well, if, if the uh, negative returns are driven by specific, say, industries, uh, maybe other industries are performing particularly well. Okay. Well, that basically, um, the idea um, is that maybe the negative forecast for the index is due to um, is due to certain sectors performing poorly, but other sectors might perform okay. Okay. So then, what do you do? 
And stock selection, which is what well, we're Selection, doing. yeah, sure. So it's basically saying that some stocks might perform better than the index and other stocks uh, worse. Mm -hmm. Overall, when you put everything together, it looks like the index is going to do poorly. So what do you do here? Basically what we're going to do, we're going to develop an algorithm to select the best uh, securities. It might be, after we finish this exercise, that what I'll call our buy list, our buy list has got hopefully a much higher um, uh, expected performance than the index itself. That's our goal. Okay, now this is a subtle point, but this is where it gets difficult. Everything that we've done so far is based upon indices, whether a country index, a sector index, everything on indices. All of our models have been built upon indices. Now all of a sudden, we're going to talk about constructing our own version of the index. So when we're going to buy France, we're not necessarily going to buy the stocks that, that track the, the MSCI France. We're going to actually go and try to figure out the securities that will perform the best. Can we see that this kind of like affects the whole exercise of asset allocation? So what does it mean when you do like an optimal investment uh, strategy, a mean varying strategy based upon indices, but you're not really going to use those indices? This could be misleading. So our index forecast return for France is going to underweight France. But we know we've got a portfolio of securities that we expect to outperform the index. If we actually use those in the asset allocation algorithm, it might be the reverse. It might be an overweight of France. Okay, so um, it, I know it's, it's a little difficult to keep track of all of this, but this is a very uh, critical point. You only do the asset allocation step based upon indices if that's what you're actually going to invest in, indices. Okay, and a lot of the tactical stuff that we do is best handled through the, uh, the futures market. Okay, low transactions costs and we can rebalance very quickly um, the weights and, and extract extra performance. But in a broader sense, there's this ability to go beyond the indices and select securities that we think will outperform the index. If that's our strategy, if we're going to do the so-called bottom-up strategy where we look at individual securities, then we have to rethink our asset allocation mechanism. And how would you change the asset allocation algorithm? At least the algorithm is okay. How would you change the inputs? The to the algorithm. So if we're going to do individual stock selection, create our own baskets, would you use the MSCI France? No, it doesn't make any sense. We'd use the portfolio that we think is the target portfolio. Okay, so um, one of the, the issues that I see um, as kind of important in the practice of asset management is that within an asset management firm, you've got one group doing the asset allocation, and you've got another group doing so-called bottom-up selection. So one doing top-down, one doing bottom-up. Well, it's kind of obvious that they need to talk to each other. Really obvious. And often they don't. So you get some asset allocation recommendations uh, from the very top that will change the, the tilt of the portfolio. Yet, it could be a completely different story if you actually looked at the bottom-up selection. Okay? So what we're going to do is bottom-up right now. We're going to go we're gonna try to develop some criteria to do uh, stock selection. I'm going to show you some results. There's lots of results. Um, the actual um, results I'm going to show you are for three particular markets. And I think for those of you that took the what is the valuation course that have some experience with uh, doing stock screening? You appreciate why I, I chose these markets. They don't have that many securities in them. 
Okay, and to show you the same results for the U.S., uh, it's, it's, it's pretty um, overwhelming, to say the least. Um, the three markets that I've chosen to examine are um, three uh, emerging markets, and they're chosen on purpose because we actually formulate the strategy uh, with the holdout period. And it just so happens that the out-of-sample period covers the Asian crisis. So there's where your model really has to work. Okay, and we actually have in-sample and, and out-of-sample results for all of that. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't really matter, uh, the actual application to the particular market. It, it's very general. So the models that we will discuss um, are appropriate not just for emerging markets, but uh, for developed markets as well. There's not much difference. Okay. There's difference, of course, in terms of what factors are important, but the general framework that I'm going to go through is pretty robust to the type of market that you look at. Okay, so what I want to do is to build uh, some selection models. The first thing that I need to do is to show you the different methods to actually do that. And there's two main methods that I want to focus on, and then, uh, and then we'll kind of get into some results. Okay, first method is going to be a regression-based technique, and the second method is going to be a sorting-based technique, or a screening technique. Most of the time, we're going to spend on the screening and the sorting, but you need to know the regression and its potential limitations. Indeed, that's what we've been doing, right? I've been talking about cross-sectional regression. So you need to know that, and a number of popular models for asset management use this cross-sectional regression approach. And I need to, to show you how to do that, how to implement it, and I also need to show you what the limitations are of that particular uh, technique. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go and, and uh, to the overhead. And let's uh, first do uh, cross-sectional And this will be prediction. Okay. Now this is very similar to what we did uh, last time. Okay, except now we're going to have a broad universe of securities. So suppose the market has got um, the market's got. Let's keep it simple with a thousand securities. raw materials that we're working with. And what we're going to do is to run a regression where we'll have at time t a thousand different returns. And I think if I use the same dates here, um, these could be in January 2001. And we're going to have a number of predictor variables on the right hand side, a thousand each match to the firm. And let's uh, use D's here, I guess. It's D1. And I'm going to call it um, attribute 1 at T minus 1 plus D2 attribute 2 at T minus 1. Okay? <coughs> this attribute 1 might be the price to book ratio, it might be the debt equity ratio, it might be uh, price to prospective earnings. It might be some measure of growth or momentum. We're going to go through a long list of possible factors here. These factors are firm-specific factors. Okay, and it's all matched. So the data is exactly matched um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the firms. So each row represents firm number one. Um, it's not unusual to have 40. Forty different factors here. Remember I said the other day that we've got lots of data, so uh, with lots of data we can have uh, more 
predictor variables. Some of these 40s, uh, 40 variables are simply going to be like industry uh, dummies, stuff like that. So some of them could be indicator variables. But this is uh, the basic setup. We talked about this in some detail last lecture that um, the coefficients, one of the problems that we face is that these coefficients could be unstable through time. And we talked about different methods. So all of this t minus 1 is December 2000 data. Okay? So it's just a matter of running the regression. So let's say we run this regression, we get estimates of D0, D1, <coughs> D2, and D40, where that little hat represents the estimate. Then we simply observe the attribute January 2001, multiply the attribute by the coefficient, add the intercept, and we get predicted returns for February 2001. Everybody see that? So we estimate this, we pick off the coefficients, and then we substitute in the January 2001 attribute, the firm specific attribute. We get predicted values. With the predicted values, um, we've got 1,000 different predicted values for uh, February 2001. And then I think we discussed this last time, what we do, sort them, and develop a buy list and a sell list. Okay, so this is number one, estimate the regression. Number two, get the predicted R T plus one, which is going to be for February 2001. Number three, sort from high to low. And number four, buy the highs. And obviously, uh, sell the lowest. So we actually implement a model like this. Yes? When you say sell, are you talking shorting? Could be, yeah. Just out actually, um, <coughs> a lot of what we're going to talk about is kind of a so-called <coughs> long-short strategy. I think it's the best way to think about implementing these models. So you're going to go long the, uh, the securities that have the highest expected returns, and then you would short the securities that have the lowest expected returns. And uh, you do it carefully, so you basically take the index out of play. Okay, so you make sure that you end up with a beta of zero. Okay? So you're referring to sell as a short. To yes, function. sell will be short. Okay? Um, it, it might be that in some of these markets, it's uh, just incredibly difficult to sell short or it's impossible. Or the transactions cost is really massive. If that's the case, just go with your buy portfolio. Okay, so that's a different strategy but go for your buy portfolio. And indeed, sometimes the way that we use the sell portfolio, especially with um, international uh, investment, uh, where, where it's difficult to short, how, how to use the sell portfolio. So let's say you're in a market, and you're an investor in that market, um, and there's 1,000 securities, and you get predicted returns for February 2001. And there's 100 of these securities that your program says sell. So you can't short sell them. What do you do? Yes? You can buy options. Well, that's a possibility. Um, so you could have some sort of put option strategy. Um, let's assume there's no derivatives. If there's no shorting, then it's going to be probably unlikely uh, that you've got an active derivatives market. What do you do with the information that says this security is going to perform very poorly? Hmm? You 
Can't short. What do you do? Can buy some short selling. Buy, buy the security? And then short selling. Uh, that would be a wash, right? So you bought and sold it, then you have you know the security. <laughs> what if you have it in your portfolio already? So just get rid of it. Yeah. So it's just basically telling you what to dump. Right? If you have a thousand predicted returns, right, and you've got like really like low or negative predictive returns for some securities, they happen to be in your portfolio, just get rid of them. Yes? If you can't short, how do you get rid of the market specific risk, whereas if you are allowed to short, you yeah. can hedge your way? It's, it's more, obviously it's more difficult to do. You actually, if there's no long short, um, it's gonna be much more difficult to do. If you had um, a futures index trading, which is unlikely, uh, you could do it. But if, if you can't, do this hedge strategy where some are long, some are short, it's going to be extremely difficult to get rid of it. And you have to go to a different strategy. So the long short strategy is basically a market neutral strategy. Whereas if you're just forced to buy stuff, then it's not market neutral. Then you're just benchmarked to the market. Okay? So you have to make some uh, choices. Yes. yes Not to get too deep into the weeds, but when we're buying and selling, or we're talking about buying equally weighted basically portions of each security, correct? Dollar value or whatever? Or just simply buy whatever you can get your hands on depending on these markets? Uh, well, it does depend on the market, but the actual strategy is not so obvious. Should we be doing equally weighted buying or value weighted buying? Right. And I'm gonna show you results on both. Okay, it depends on, when you do a, an equally weighted strategy, you do have a bias in your, your actual portfolio formation. And what's that bias? You're doing equally weighted. Favoring the smaller companies? Favoring smaller companies. Everybody see that? that? If we put the same amount of uh, capital in each security, then we basically overweight small, small cap. So you gotta be careful there. And indeed, when we actually go through some of these, uh, these runs, you're gonna see kind of a size effect because you'll notice a difference between an equally weighted strategy and a value weighted strategy. Yes, John. Um, when you're using this strategy, are you sort of assuming that you believe in like the momentum strategy as opposed to a contrarian strategy, or do those variables sort of? One of these variables could be momentum. You know, if I think momentum is important for the security, then maybe A1 is the the mm -hmm. lag return. I'll put it right in there to see if it comes in. But the very in general, the variables that you're using, they're not necessarily saying, saying because the stock did the best in the past that you should go along those and short the others. You're using other variables. Using other variables. So this is a, a multivariate methodology. It looks at many different factors at the same time. So suppose we had momentum in there, but we also had um, some value indicator, like price to book. Okay? <laughs> what the regression is saying, well, is there an incremental effect of momentum when we control for price to book or, or value effect. So it's a multivariate strategy. And in this one, it's got lots of dimensions. You're controlling for 40 different things. And, it, and that, that's very useful information. You might have size in here also. So maybe the, the value effect is simply a size effect. And this is a way to test work. Once I control for size, is there anything left over that would uh, lead to better returns based upon um, a momentum strategy. Okay? This is basically the way this stuff works. So it's a regression based methodology. Okay, so everybody, you know, we've done this uh, probably, this is the third time we've gone through this. Hopefully people are comfortable with it. People do uh, average these uh, D coefficients to make them a little more stable or stack all the data together. Um, somebody um, was at the break last time suggested, well, you know, if you've got one of these Ds each period, so every single month I'm running a cross-sectional regression, so I'm going to have a D, like a D1, every single month, because I'm running a regression across all firms every month. So if you really care about the D next period, why don't you forecast the D1 directly? You've got data for it? Yeah, you could do that. And my guess is that forecasting it, you're going to have better luck 
then assuming the forecast is some simple average of the past V1. So are there variables that influence the behavior of D1? Well, you can figure it out. So there is an exercise where you can actually forecast these cross-sectional coefficients in time series. They're just data. Okay? So that's kind of like the, in a way, kind of the third level of complexity in this course. First level was the time series regression, which you're all familiar with in other courses. And you did that in assignment two and assignment three and assignment four. <coughs> the next level is this cross-sectional regression, where you're regressing, regressing across different firms based upon lagged values for the individual firms, a slice of time. And then the third <coughs> level is, well, from those cross-sectional regressions that I obtain every single month, I could collect the D1s and then try to forecast those in a time series regression. You can see it can get confusing. But what really is going to count in terms of your performance is to get that D1 right next period. Okay? So this is a regression-based approach. It's multivariate. It is a strategy that, uh, that is used by uh, a number of um, investment management firms. And what I want to spend most of the time, as I said, is about talking about uh, an alternative that appears simpler, but in some ways it can be more complex. Okay, so what I want to move to is a screening strategy. So sometimes this is known as sorting <coughs> or screening. Now I think that, uh, that some of you in the valuation course had some experience doing some screens based upon fundamental variables. Is that correct? So how many actually, if you raise your hand if, uh, if you actually have done this in Excel where you screen securities for a particular attribute and tried to create a, a trading strategy. So maybe half the class have got some experience with this. And, and those that have actually done this know that this can be very painful uh, exercise to do in Excel. Very painful. Um, especially with a lot of securities. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe um, some basic sorting and screening techniques. And uh, I'm going to take it uh, simple at the beginning and then kind of build up to something more complex. Okay, so the first thing I need for you to all understand is what a univariate screen is. And that's going to be one attribute. And this is probably close to what you did in, in valuation. Indeed, I've talked to some of you, I've seen some of the reports uh, from valuation. Okay, and um, the key thing, it's going to be simple. You're all going to understand how to do these sorts if you don't already. Okay, so we're going to we're going to sort by different attributes and develop portfolios. That's easy to do. Difficult thing to do is how to put it all together. So what does it mean? So it might be that I'm going to sort by a number of different attributes. And I'm going to find that, wow, if I sort by price to book, that really works. I can really distinguish high and low um, uh, stock return performance. But does that mean you want to take that single attribute and develop an investment strategy upon it? One thing? It seems unlikely to me. You know, that said, there's a lot of people out there that do dividend discount model like um, screening and use one attribute. And we don't want to use one attribute in this course. It's just, it's way too naive to think that you can develop a strategy that works out of sample. It might work in sample. It might work in the past. It might look really good. But it's naive to think 
that if we could develop a strategy based upon one thing that's going to work out of sample and be sustainable. Indeed, there's people out there right now <coughs> sweeping through uh, the data, trying to figure out what that one factor is. Okay. Let me be careful here. Let's refer to these things as, um, as attributes, though you'll see in, in some of the documentation we call them factors. Let's not get confused here. Remember, the terminology that I like to use in this course, the factors are contemporaneous. Attributes and instruments and things like that, everything is going to be lagged. We're doing prediction, it must be lagged. Okay? So that's kind of where we're heading. So let me describe a univariate sort, how to implement that. And, and let's take the example of, um, well, why don't we use the S&P 500? We used that before. And let's say that the attribute that we're going to sort on is um, the earnings price ratio. Okay, I'm not going to sort on price earnings. I'm going to sort on earnings price. The reason? Zero. Yeah, zeros give me a problem. OK, so, so let's say we do that. Um, so I've got a data sample, suppose it's from let's say January 1980 through the present. Okay, and I've got the stock returns all lined up with, uh, with the price earnings ratios. And then um, my first date is January 31st, 1980. I observe all the price earnings ratios for the S&P 500 and I sort, sort from low to high. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at fractal performance. And fractal will be the number of groups that we actually look at. And suppose that uh, I look at quintiles, which will be five different groups of 100. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, the securities that have got um, the lowest <coughs> earnings to price January 31st the 100 of them, I'm going to track their performance in February 1980. And then I'll look at the, uh, the, the other extreme fractal, or quintile, <coughs> the ones with the highest earnings to price. Let's track their performance in February 1980. Okay, and let's ignore the stuff in the middle. There's 300 securities we're going to ignore. And uh, there was a question earlier, how, how do we do the weighting? Let's suppose we use the value weights. Okay, so the weights that these securities actually have in, in the S&P 500. So I will observe a return for that portfolio in February 1980 for the, t the high portfolio and the low portfolio. And then February 28th, I observe a new set of earnings to price ratios. I do a new sort, and I've got a new portfolio for the lowest earnings price ratios, and a new portfolio for the highest earnings price ratios. And again, I hold that for one month. At the end of March, I repeat the exercise. It's called a univariate sort. And then just continue that all the way through to the end of the data. The last time I can actually do this uh, will be to realize a return for January uh, 2001, based upon December 2000 earning price ratio. So now I've got monthly returns for the first quintile from February 1980 all the way through to January 2001. And I've got monthly returns for the fifth quintile from February 1980 to January 2001. These are strategies based upon univariate sort, univariate being one variable, the earnings price ratio. And then what I can do is to look at the performance. Calculate the average performance of 
the Quintal 1 portfolio, the average performance of the Quintal 2 portfolio, or Quintal 5 portfolio. Okay. So is that, um, that seems straightforward? Because, you know, again, some of you have actually done this. Um, now, there's a lot of subtle things that we're kind of like uh, glossing over here. Like, for example, if I give you uh, the list of the S&P 500 uh, in January 2001, would you be able to actually go and do this strategy? Let's say I gave you the 500 securities and I give you the historical data back to January 1980 for the 500 securities. Yes? It'll have the survivorship bias, some of the securities we could do. So what I've given you is are, are the securities in the 500 right now. Okay, so how many of those securities were actually in the 500 <laughs> in January 1980? Not all of them. So, so securities go in and out all the time. So to actually implement the strategy, well, it, it sounds simple to do, you know, a couple of lines of, of code. It's not so simple to actually implement because you've got to be very careful that you've got the exact list of the securities that are in the S&P 500 in January, January 1980, and then all the way through. Now, how do you treat um, a situation where you form your portfolio, um, and uh, it turns out on January 31st, 1980, you form your portfolio, you've got the list of the 500. In your uh, Quintile 1 portfolio, halfway through uh, February, the stock basically drops out, goes to zero. So what do you do there? So you actually, you, you, how, do you, how do you calculate the return? in February 1980. You got a stock that dropped. So you had, you know, 100 you went into the month and then 99 at the end. What do you do? You register a negative 100% return on that stock. Yeah, because the zero goes to zero. Too bad. Now hopefully you have enough securities there that uh, you've got a diversified portfolio. That's kind of, you know, if you're buying that portfolio, and we don't know if we're buying it, but if we're buying that portfolio, it just means that you've got something that goes to zero. Related to this, there's another question. What happens if a stock goes into Chapter 11 bankruptcy, is reorganized, and comes back in line for uh, 10 months or five years down the road? Are you supposed to be like, you sold that stock at that time at zero value, and you don't recover that? Your choice, value? yeah. It's going to be tricky. You know, Some of these stocks do, they don't go to zero, but the trading could be suspended. and. Um, you have to figure out what to do. There's so many subtle issues in actually implementing this. Okay. And, um, and just to get the list of the 500 is not so easy. Okay. Now what I recommend in actually doing this is not doing this manually, but actually going to um, a database of database programs, you know, uh, like FactSet, where you just enter the command, sort into quintiles, the S&P 500 from 1980 to 2001. And it will do it automatically. It's got in its memory the list of the S&P 500 going back. So it's going to save you an enormous amount of time to actually implement this. Yes? Well, actually, we discussed this problem in our team, uh, the, uh, the, the survivorship bias. Yes. And we say that uh, if one just co continuously mimics the composition of the index, so for example, just create the portfolio that is equal to the composition of S&P 500 <coughs> in 1980, then Whenever the composition changes, the person just sells the stocks which are being dropped and just has the new ones. Then, would you say that this takes care of this problem? Uh, it, it does. So you're not you're not um, looking forward. It'd be far worse to do it the other way, where you take the list in in uh, 2001 and backtrack it, backfill it. Um, that's going to be okay, but that puts a lot of constraints on what you're doing. Right? This, you know, it, it's okay. There's no survivorship bias. But it's, it's clearly not optimal strategy. So if you had the ability to pick the list up every single month, that would be better. Because eventually, you're getting down to a smaller and smaller list of securities that are available if you're doing the S&P 500. Well, why is that? I thought it would be vice versa. Oh, you don't stick to the. If you stick, stick to the list in, in uh, January 1980, 
by the time you get to you know, the end of the 1990s, you're working with 350 securities, not 500. Right, so if you, if you change the portfolio composition every time the index is changed, then that's, that would be the, the optimal strategy? That would be the best thing to do if you really are looking at the S&P 500. That's the best thing to do. I'm just saying, it's not easy to do. It's easy to talk about, but to actually implement um, is more subtle. Okay, so this is a univariate sort. So we sorted it on EP. And we can track that through time. Now, the sort of methodology that I'm going to follow is to look at a series of univariate sorts. So we're going to specify some variables that we think are going to be important some candidate variables, just like we brainstormed for assignment number two, sort of variables that might predict returns in a time series. Well, we're going to do the same thing with kind of fundamental data, and we're going to have a list of variables. And then I'm going to execute univariate sorts, and some of them will be quintiles, some of them will be tritiles, which means three groups, depending upon the number of securities that we're looking at in a particular market. So for the US, you might look at deciles, so 10, 10 portfolios. But in a market with very few securities, you might just look at tritots, so three groups. So I'm going to go through and look at the performance of the first fractal versus the last fractal. Okay. And the difference in the returns of those two fractals are going to tell us something about the ability to pursue that particular attribute in a long, short strategy. Okay, so if it's the case that the, uh, when I looked at the, the average return of fractal one, which is, uh, I guess, the low EP, versus fractal five, which is the high EP, I look at the performance and I notice, oh, well, um, fractal one is like, on average, 2% per month. But fractal five is a half a percent of them. Yeah, it's telling you something. It's telling you something about the ability to form an investment strategy based upon a single attribute. That there's some information in this EP ratio that's going to be important for stock selection. Okay. Now let me tell you where we're going before we kind of go through all the details. This is where we're going. We're going to do this for 30 some odd attributes. We go through, do the univariate portfolio. Um, we're going to look at the performance of the high fractal versus the low fractal for 30 some odd um, uh, attributes. Now, the real key here is, like I said earlier, how do you put it together? So suppose out of the 30, I come up with three things that, that appear like really powerful. So what do I do? So suppose it's earnings price, and there's a momentum variable, and then maybe the revision ratio, IBIS revision ratio. So what do I do with that? So for each one of those univariate sorts, I've got securities in the, in the high fractile and the low fractile. How do I put them together? That's going to be the key to stock selection. Anybody can do one of these sorts. That's easy. And, and FactSet makes it particularly easy for you. You do the sort. But how do you put them all together to develop a buy list and a sell list? That's the key. Because you know, I'll, I'll tell you right now, that when you do this, and you find there's three attributes, there's going to be some securities that are in the, um, the earnings price strategy buy list that are in the sell list for some other attribute. Okay, so, so what do you do? Which one do you listen to? Listen to earnings price or you listen, listen to the revision ratio? So how do we put our portfolio together with these attributes? Now, how would we put it together if we're using a regression? 
we have three variables, right? So it might be that the, the univariate uh, methodology could be useful for kind of pre-screening the regression. So instead of like loading the regression with 30 some odd things, you can load it with three. And the regression is pretty simple. It gives you the, um, the forecast of return across all the securities and then you can develop your buy list and sell list. The problem with the regression is that those D coefficients could be flipping through time. And we haven't really controlled for that. Okay, so, so one thing that you need to see, and it's difficult to see, is the difference between the regression methodology and the sorting methodology. Okay. So if we're implementing a simple algorithm, a univariate sort based upon earnings price, that gives us returns <coughs> every single month, February 1980 through January 1980. How would we implement the same thing in a regression? Well, there's one attribute, earnings price. So we regress our securities on earnings price. The first time we can do that is, I guess, February, uh, February 1980 returns, regressed on January 1980 earnings price ratio. So we get a D0, the intercept, a D1. We sort. And then we can actually implement this, uh, well, actually, I just jumped ahead. We got a D1 and uh, a D0. We feed it the February 1980 uh, earnings price ratios and get forecasts for March. Okay, so our first actual return would be in March 1980. So we lose uh, one month when we do the regression. That's not a big deal. And then we could re-estimate the next month and do the forecasting exercise, create the new uh, portfolio, and continue to do that through the data. And as we get more data, we actually might want to be averaging the D1 coefficient and the D0 coefficient. We can't do that right at the beginning, but we could actually do that. Somebody see that there's going to be a difference in the strategies? Right? Because the D1, uh, the first time I estimate it might be positive, the second time it might be negative. This can be a real difference in the strategies. Okay? If the D1 was simply the same every single period, some positive number, then it's going to be identical. So the sorting, while it seems simple, is not regression based, is kind of in a way allowing for some dynamics in the regression and don't have to do these things like smoothing the D1 and, and the D0. And what I'll talk about a little later is that we can think of the sorting algorithm as a very special type of regression called a multinomial probit. And that's basically um, a regression of ranks. So instead of actually looking at the returns, you simply rank by something. So it doesn't really matter if the earnings price ratio uh, for the number one firm is, uh, is, is you know, 0.5, and then there's a big gap to the next one. The gap doesn't matter. It's just that it's number one number two. So when you're doing sorting, you don't use all the information. You use the information in the rank. That's basically it. Think about what we're doing. We're sorting by earnings price. And there could be a huge dispersion in earnings price across a thousand securities. We're not using the values other than to get the rank from number one slot to number one thousand slot. That's all the information we're using is the rank. Okay, so where are we going? We've got a sorting algorithm. It's different from regression. It's maybe an advantage that you don't have to estimate any coefficients, at least right now. It's simple to implement once we account for all these subtle things like uh, things going in and out of the index. It's fairly simple to do. And we can take a look at performance of many different 
attributes. Then what we're going to do is consider more than one attribute at the same time. So we consider more than one, we call it a bivariate sort. <coughs> we're going to be looking at the earnings price ratio and the leverage of the firm, the debt equity ratio. And I want to take a look at patterns across two different criteria. Indeed, the, the standard thing that I always use is um, a bivariate sort with the attribute and market capitalization. And one thing that I look for is for the attribute to have some ability to forecast returns across all different size categories. Okay? And if it does, then that's impressive. <coughs> And sometimes what you'll find is that it's simply picking up the size effect. The size effect kind of dominates. Okay, so we could be doing bivariate sorts. We could do trivariate sorts, but I actually don't do these. And that's going to give us extra information about the power of these attributes to forecast the cross section. And then we're going to put all this stuff together. There's a number of different methodologies. Um, indeed, there's nothing written on this. Okay. Indeed, in my articles that I published on stock selection, lots of detailed analysis. Some of the same tables that I passed out today um, are there. But the one thing that's not published in those articles is the algorithm that we use to actually put it all together. And when you put it all together, we call it, um, just so you know the terminology, um, we call it a scoring screen. Okay, so that's a screen that uses multiple characteristics, multiple attributes, and they're all weighted together in a special way. There's two different methodologies that we use to do this. <coughs> so that's the stuff that's missing. That's the stuff that doesn't happen in FactSet. FactSet will do a bivariate or univariate sort, take a look at the results, and kind of figure out what's important. And if you just want to go with a bivariate or univariate uh, investment strategy, fine, it's there. Tells you what the buy list is, tells you what the sell list is. <coughs> but what you can't get is the actual method to put it all together, to figure out what your final buy list is and your final sell list. Question. Can you explain again, how do you do the bivariate sort? Uh, you know, like what kind of weights do you put to individual attributes to come up with uh, a ranking? Sure. Um, yeah, because we just talked about uh, a univariate sort. Let's uh, let just. Bivariate screen. So it's going to be two attributes. And let's continue with our example of um, let's continue with our example of earnings price. We sort all securities by earnings price. Okay, and let's say that we've got um, let's say we've got 500 securities. We've got quintiles. Okay. And uh, that means we've got 100 securities in the lowest earnings price quintile. And now let's sort those again into another set of quintiles. And let's sort by leverage, debt to equity ratio. So how many securities in each portfolio now? 20. So, so for the given level of, uh, of earnings price, sort again by something else. Now you've got a grid, a five by five grid. If you do this every single period, a grid of portfolio returns. Each portfolio has only got 20 securities in it. But now we can say, what if we look at the performance of the lowest earnings price ratio and at the same time, within that group, the lowest debt equity. Question. Doesn't it seem like the order with which you 
sort the attributes is going to really change your outcome, why wouldn't you do something like maybe averaging the two attributes or, or some method of, of scoring the two attributes, averaging them, and then sorting them just using one sort instead? Because it seems like the results would be kind of questionable if you pay a Right, so the question is, uh, the order matters? Absolutely. So if we did the debt equity sort first, and then did the earnings price sort, we have different securities in our portfolios. Something to look at, the order of the sort. Uh, is it possible to do just one sort by kind of creating a composite uh, sort of attribute? Yes, it is. So you could actually create in an ad hoc way um, source, some sort of composite ad attribute. Like you could standardize, for example. Suppose you standardized um, the earnings price ratios by subtracting the cross-sectional mean divided by the cross-sectional standard deviation. So that means it's going to have a range of approximately minus 2 to plus 2 with 95% confidence. And then you could have the same thing done for the, the leverage. And then you can multiply them together. And you've got one thing to sort by. And that would give equal weights, and it would also be a standardization. Exactly. So there's many different ways. Now you can see, hopefully, that this is not as simple as just cranking a regression. Okay, so there's, there's going to be a lot of choice as to what we do. Yes? Well, I think what Brian and Prakash are really onto is that you're making this sort of a priori qualitative judgment that in this case, for example, earnings to price is more important than leverage because you, you would stand a chance of losing basically your best leverage sort, I mean, the best leverage candidates if they didn't already fall into that upper right or a lower left box. Correct. Correct. And I guess what we're sort of maybe inquiring is, is there some way to recapture those really good leverage candidates, even if they're not the best or the absolute best earnings to price candidates? Right. And especially if you're going to start to do this with lots and lots of screens, you the order is going to make a big difference. It, it does. Yeah, I, look, I totally agree with what you're saying. So one thing to do would be to look at um, the bivariate sort the other way. Okay, so reverse the order of the sorts. The other thing to do would be uh, to look at many different bivariate sorts with the leverage variable. The other thing to do would be to look at the univariate sort with the leverage, see what you can learn about that. And really where we're going is, is some sort of weighting, as you said. Weighting of these attributes all together, which one is the most important, which one is the second most important, develop this so-called scoring But screen. that's becoming a regression. In a way, yes. Without the parametric assumptions of the regression. Yeah, it will have to do with optimization. But remember, the regression is forcing a lot of structure on our data. And what I'm doing is something a little more general. Question? Um, when, when you were um, talking about uh, having a composite index and standardizing the two attributes, uh, that means that we're still placing, in a way, an equal weight on both of them. That's While correct. if we regress, we are still trying to capture the importance in predicting. That's so yeah. If we That's have true. The way that we formulated this, um, it was uh, an equal weight on, on both of them. Suppose we, you know, there could be a scenario where we standardize the two attributes. Okay, and then we take, um, then we just add. Let's say we add three to the standardization. Okay, remember the standardization is generally between minus 2 and plus 2 because it turns it into kind of a, like a normal distribution. Suppose we just push the distribution forward so there's no negative values. Okay. So we've got these things that range from effectively 0 to, let's say, 5. Everything's standardized 0 to 5. And we could do that explicitly also, put it within that range. <coughs> okay. And if we think the leverage is twice as important, then you multiply the leverage variable by 2. Then add it to your other variable, and you've got a composite variable that you can sort. So there's stuff that you can do. I'm not saying that's the optimal thing to do, but there's stuff where you can get rid of the, uh, the equal weight. So you're giving one attribute double the weight in the sort. I think, I think what we're questioning is, isn't the purpose of all this to find which attributes are important rather than Said, you know, we're, we're just a priori. Say, say a little louder. I think that's the question we're having. Like, 
what Chris was saying is, you know, is the purpose of the model is to figure out which coefficient, which attributes are most important, and to find out what weightings we should place in them rather than testing them on a okay, let's double this one, let's you know triple this one, or whatever. Because it seems like then we're kind of throwing throwing darts at the board. Uh, actually, what we're trying to do, like if you really think of this problem in the most general sense, is we are trying to develop a strategy that's got the maximum possible expected return for some level of risk. That's what we're trying to do. Okay? And if I use a regression, it forces a lot of um, assumptions, a lot of restrictions on how I can actually do that. What I'm going to try to do is to use this sort of attribute screening methodology to get a little more flexibility. And I'm going to use the same ideas of regression a little later on to kind of put these attributes together with the right weights. Okay, so we need to identify which attributes are important, and we need to put the optimal weights on those attributes. If I do that, then I've got a strategy that's going to deliver, hopefully, um, a high expected return and a low expected return. So that's kind of where we're going. So just kind of like sketching this stuff right now, we need to actually go through, list the attributes, and I need to show you how to actually do this. I'm showing you how to do a univariate and bivariate sort, but what I haven't shown you is how to put it together. And it's going to take some work to actually get there. And I want to actually take my time doing that because it's very important. I want to show you some reports of the univariate sorts so you can look to see how to read those uh, reports. And we need to take a break, but um, just like one thing that you might notice. If you look at the average performance by a particular attribute, let's say earnings price, it might be the quintile one. You know, it does great compared to quintile five. You say, well, maybe I should. Um, create a strategy based upon earnings price. But that's based upon like two statistics, the mean return for quintile one and the mean return for quintile five. It might be, and it sometimes is the case, that quintile one did great in 1980, in 1981, in 82, and then it, it's done terrible ever since. But because of the big years that it had early in the data, it looks like it's a better performer. So we can't just look at the average returns. We have to look at the performance through time. We have to look at consistency through time. If quintile one is flipping with quintile five in terms of best performance, then I don't have a lot of comfort with that particular uh, strategy. It's analogous to the uh, regression sign flipping in a simple regression. So this is difficult. It involves a lot of art to actually do this. But the payoff is very significant. OK, let's take, uh, take our break now. Okay, let's uh, get started, please. Okay, so this is kind of where we are. If we do the regression, we got the weights immediately, right? Just get the predicted values, and we know what to do in terms of our, uh, our selection. But we know that the regression imposes a lot of structure, and some of that structure might be suboptimal. For example, it might be that the coefficients are changing sign, or you know, something like that that could complicate what we're doing. So now what we're going to do is to do these simple univariate sorts we can go through a number of, uh, of different possible attributes. We're going to take a look at the sorts in terms of their performance. And then what we're going to try to do is to identify a subset of those attributes that appear to lead to a good spread between the top um, fractile and the bottom fractile. And then we're going to work with those to try to figure out what an optimal portfolio strategy would be. Okay. So another way of um, 
of thinking, you can cast all of this in a regression framework, as I said, <coughs> but we're actually doing some stuff that is a little more flexible than regression. Actually, uh, let me take that, a lot more flexible. What do you mean by flexible? Uh, the regression is forcing a coefficient on the data. We're not, we're not estimating anything. What are we estimating? Well, we're sort of trying to, I mean, what I'm trying to take away from this is that you're sort of saying that we're looking for, in a sense, a fit, but not like a, a forced regression fit, a sort of soft fit. That's correct. Okay. So it's more, it's take, we're hoping that is, that, is that softness, though, basically us putting in our qualitative assessment of how important these factors are? There's going to be some to optimization also. So there will be, you know, even what we do, there will be some fitting. But, but think of how, how can we actually use the regression? We've got, let's say, three things that work for this particular market. Three attributes. Well, one thing we could do is to estimate the regression every single period and then get the expected returns in form a portfolio the next period and re-estimate. Okay, we could get uh, a buy portfolio and a sell portfolio using that regression. Right? The other thing that we could do is um, force the regression coefficients to be constant somehow. Okay, so we could use the initial coefficients or we could use maybe hold out the first five years of data, estimate those coefficients, just hold them constant through the rest of the data. That's a possibility. Some people would even estimate over the whole sample. So we've got a constant D0, D1, and D2, which is equivalent to just averaging <coughs> all of the individual monthly regressions, and then just start going out a sample with that. Okay, and it leads to a buy list and a sell list. But all of these, we're, we're imposing some structure on the data. I'm just gonna impose a, a different type of structure. <coughs> Remember I said that if we're just regressing on the earnings price ratio, and we looked at the strategy of just a, a simple regression doing that versus our sort, it would lead to different results. Right? So what I want to do is to see how far we can actually get with the sorting methodology. In the end, we will have to estimate some parameters or use judgment or, or something like that and try to extract the um, the best possible uh, performance. Now, one, one question you might ask is, well, you've got these alternatives, why don't you do a horse race? And I've done that for some of these markets. And actually, I went into the horse race thinking, <laughs> if you actually look at my papers, um, almost all my papers have like regressions in them. And I went into this thinking, sorting? You know, you should do a regression, that's optimal. Well, I was pretty surprised because this sorting actually induces some flexibility that the regression doesn't have. So the performance of the sorting-based strategy, once we overlay um, kind of an optimal weighting, that turned out to be uh, superior to the simple uh, regression-based uh, selection. Okay. So, so we need to, as I said, go through this, figure out what to look at, um, and uh, I think that people are uh, sometimes led to the regression-based approach because it's regression without actually thinking about what sort of restrictions it's posing on the data. Okay, so let's go through, um, I want to actually go through a report, I want to go through some of the data that I look at in terms of evaluating whether a particular attribute <coughs> Is, um, is important, okay? And then after we do this, we can kind of um, figure out whether we could extract the same sort of um, diagnostic with a regression, okay? So let's, uh, let's first do this. And this is um, uh, within the handout, um, I think it's called definitions and performance diagnostics and definitions. Okay, so uh, suppose we've done um, a univariate sort on something like earnings to price. 
And we've got monthly data on each of the fractile returns. This is the, uh, the sort of report um, that uh, I've put together um, based upon <coughs> that type of analysis. So number one thing is what is the, the average return? And all of these are, are going to be linked to the uh, spreadsheets that I've also handed out, <coughs> just so you know what's in each of these uh, the cells of the spreadsheet. So I'm just going through the definitions. So average return, uh, it's a geometric average return. So it's a, kind of a buy and hold return. Um, point number two is um, kind of a, an index return. So it's indexed at 100, sometimes called a VAMI. Um, so that's just a, a convention for a portfolio evaluation. Um, number three is the volatility of the returns. And notice the wording here, post rank portfolio. That just means that after it's been ranked, we look at the return after the ranking. Um, then um, number four and number five are um, returns over and above a benchmark. So RM is just going to be the market portfolio in the particular market that we're looking at. So the S&P 500 for the US, let's say, or uh, the MSCI portfolio in the UK, whatever <coughs> the benchmark we're actually looking at. Um, column number five is the excess return uh, over and above uh, a T-bill rate. Um, and then we've got two volatilities of the excess returns one for the, the benchmark and one for uh, the risk-free. The volatility uh, versus the benchmark, what's that, uh, what's that called? Tracking error, standard deviation of the return uh, minus the, the bench, if the benchmark is the market return. And then in um, number eight, We've got a T statistic, and this tests whether the, the performance is different from zero on average. Column nine, we've got the beta versus the market. Okay, so the same RM. Okay. Um, it says here that no legs are incorporated, so it's just a, a, a straight beta. Uh, I've also done this with uh, adjustment for infrequent trading. Uh, number 10 is the, the alpha. Okay, so taking out um, the market, is there an alpha in this portfolio strategy? 11 is the, um, is the R squared of the regression on the market. Number 12 is the uh, market capitalization. And then number 13, we start to look at performance um, uh, relative to the market. So this is the, the percentage of total observations that the uh, portfolio return was greater um, than the, uh, the market portfolio. So how many times did, what is the percentage of months that we actually beat the market uh, portfolio or our benchmark? This is uh, kind of interesting because it might be that your, your average excess return relative to the benchmark is positive, but if you're only beating the market 30% of the time, that's maybe not that impressive for the particular attribute that you're looking at. Number 14, take a look at the performance Take a look at the performance um, when the benchmark is up. So in up ben benchmark periods, what is the percentage of months that we beat the up benchmark? And number 15 is the same sort of statistic except for down benchmark returns. Number 16 is the maximum number of consecutive benchmark outperformances. So it's just what is the longest string of outperforming of the benchmark. Number 17 tells us the maximum positive excess return. And number 18 is a, a standard risk measure, and that's the, the maximum negative uh, excess return. Okay. 
Uh, number 19 is the percentage of periods um, that we've got uh, positive returns to negative. So this is the ratio um, of average returns greater than zero to the ratio where it's less than zero. Um, and we can also do that for negative. And then 21 is the maximum uh, number of consecutive negative periods. This is another risk uh, metric. And number 21, the maximum number of um, consecutive positive periods. And the cumulative uh, annual returns are in column 23. And then uh, we've got a relative performance metric that I'm not going to go into the detail of uh, until we actually see the sheet. And, um, and then we look at cumulative average returns over the last two years and, um, and the last five years. So the idea here is look at the recent performance because you might want to weight that greater than um, just an average of, of the past. And when we actually go into the sheet, we're going to see that we look at, um, at performance um, year by year. Okay, so it's not just good enough to to perform well in terms of average returns or percentage of periods beating the benchmark, I want to actually see what this, um, this factor is actually doing. You know, I said factor rather than attribute. Um, see how it's doing through time. Okay, And then uh, 26, 27, and 28 are some numbers that uh, just tell us something about the attribute in general. Okay, So working on the attribute across different firms rather than the actual, um, the actual return. Okay. Um, there's also some stuff that we uh, classify as uh, success rates and, and, and things like that. Um, and this is where we actually look within the portfolios that we're creating. So, um, and this is mainly isolated to the top and bottom portfolios, but we actually look at um, the number of securities within our portfolio that uh, outperform the market. Okay, if, if this is a buy portfolio, we'll take the, the percentage of securities within the portfolio, let's say there's 100 securities in it, that actually outperform the market. And we'll also look at the bottom portfolio to see how many <coughs> underperform the market. And if a lot underperform the market, that's good news because that's the so-called sell portfolio. And we'll kind of look at these uh, success rates uh, through times. The, the other thing is um, uh, universe. So I've said I've been kind of loose in terms of the benchmark that we're using. And the benchmark really depends on the market that you look at. So you can set this to go on the US with the S&P 500, or you can set it to go with the, the Morgan Stanley Capital International, you can set it to go with all stocks on the NYC and Amex and, and NASDAQ. Okay, so the universe is kind of like the raw materials that you're using for your selection strategy. Okay? And then the benchmark is going to reflect the universe. Does everybody get that? That um, if I'm using the universe of 10,000 securities in the US to form my buy portfolio and sell portfolio, then I'm not going to use the S&P 500 as a benchmark. Okay, not necessarily. Okay, I'm going to be consistent in having a benchmark uh, come from uh, the universe. There's some exceptions. You're going to see those exceptions. Okay, so that's these are the metrics that we're going to use to evaluate um, these different factors. Um, and now what I want to do is to go through some of the candidate. Um, attributes. Okay, so I'm just going to deliver a list and then um, I guess at the end I'll show you a, an example of um, a performance uh, sheet. Okay, so let's go through these. Number one, market capitalization. Okay, and in this sheet there's interpretation for each one of these attributes. Um, and there's also a prior that we've got on these. So our prior here is that the top portfolio is going to be the small caps, bottom portfolio, large cap. That's going to depend upon uh, the market that we look at. 
but we're always going to be looking at the spread between small and large cap. And there's a code that goes along with this, and this is a, a pure sort by capitalization. Now, um, I should also say that um, capitalization is not something that we ever implemented in terms of uh, an investment strategy. Capitalization is a diagnostic. There's other screening factors we'll look at also, like leverage. We mentioned leverage early on. Leverage, to me, is just a pure risk measure. And what we want to do is to form an investment strategy that is a little more complex than you know, buy the highest risk of securities and sell the lowest risk. Okay, so, um, so things like leverage, things like market capitalization where I'm just not sure what the size effect really means. Like I can understand some liquidity premium. Um, I understand some sophistication. Maybe I understand that some small firms are maybe about to grow very quickly. But size alone is more of a diagnostic uh, for me. Remember I said earlier that I look at the performance of an attribute across different size categories to see if it's resilient to different size. Okay, and that's going to help me evaluate um, uh, a particular attribute. But size is the first thing, and size works its way, works its way through all of the diagnostics here. Okay, because what you really don't want is just to pursue a, a size-based strategy. Now the other thing that I didn't mention, maybe I mentioned in some other uh, lecture, that this, this is, uh, is not just an academic exercise. This is a real investment management exercise. So um, this is something that made its way into a real world selection algorithm. Okay? So uh, the stakes were, were high, and there was a lot of care taken in doing this exercise uh, to make sure that we had the maximum out of sample uh, predictive power. For example, all of the attributes were chosen based upon one sample. And then we evaluated our final selections over a holdout sample. Okay? And it turned out that the models that we um, started with did very well in our out-of-sample uh, exercise. And you're going to see some of that. When you actually see the reports that I, I put together, all of those reports are for the whole sample. There's no difference between the in sample and another sample. And that's just to, to say, paper, I've got all of the results for the earlier sample and the later sample, but it would have tripled the, the amount of uh, handout um, for today and, and Thursday. Okay, so CAP is the first one. Um, Um, number two is an ROE measure, return on equity measure. Um, and this is basically return on equity current year minus return on equity uh, in the previous year. Number three is, a, uh, is this leverage uh, variable that's purely uh, a diagnostic uh, type of tool to see what sort of stocks uh, we're selecting in terms of leverage. Number four is the traditional uh, dividend yield. Okay, so this is uh, just the dividend yield of um, every uh, individual security that we've got. Number five is historical earnings growth momentum. So for, um, so for what we're doing, we're gonna look at momentum in stock returns, but also momentum in earnings. So we actually wanted to use the earnings to try to get some sort of growth factor. So, um, so this is the, the last 12 months trailing earnings per share um, minus the previous uh, last 12 months trailing earnings per share and then divided by the absolute um, uh, earnings, uh, which is also trailing. So this is a one year uh, momentum uh, variable based upon earnings. And number six, is a three-year measure. So instead of just looking at year to year, it's going to be three-year. Um, number seven is the earnings yield, and that's just the, um, the earnings price ratio.
Uh, number eight, we start to move into, um, into forecast earnings type of variables. So instead of just looking at past data, we've also got expectational data. So we've got um, the change in consensus FY1, that's fiscal year one, that's code from IBIS um, uh, over the last uh, three months. So this is the change in FY1 over the last three months for a particular security. Okay, that's the forecast of earnings for fiscal year uh, one out. And uh, B is the same measure, but looking over six months. Okay, so notice the difference between this variable and the previous variables. This variable is, uh, is looking at expectations in the market. And uh, again, notice that we are combining a lot of data here. We're combining stock return data, fundamental data, and expectational data, all into one database. Okay, so this is, uh, this is kind of a growth variable for expectational type of uh, earnings rather than past earnings. Number nine tells us something about what people think about the, the future path of earnings in the longer term. So FY2 is fiscal year two. And we actually look at uh, the ratio of FY2 to FY1 and look at the, uh, the change in that. Uh, number 10 is also uh, an IBIS measure, and that's the consensus earning um, revision ratio. And simply what we do here is you look at the, the upward revisions and subtract the downward revisions, divide by the total um, uh, FY1 uh, estimate. Okay, so we standardize it uh, by the FY1 estimate, but um, this is a classic uh, indicator called the revision ratio, and uh, the idea, of course, is that the more positive that is, that means it's bullish for the particular firm. Kim, is that the, is that the sum of this, the number of downward yes. upward estimates? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Uh, number 11 is the uh, price to book ratio, which we've talked about, traditional uh, value slash growth uh, sort of uh, separator. Uh, number 12 is uh, cash earnings to price. Okay, so that's just like an earnings yield, except um, we're using cash earnings rather than the usual earnings. Number 13. Uh, is uh, the standard <coughs> momentum indicator. So this is a one month uh, price momentum. And uh, 13B is a one year price momentum. Okay, so uh, there's a, a literature of momentum and it makes a difference as to how you sample the past returns. Okay, indeed, people have found a difference between uh, the performance of lag month two to 12 versus the first lag month. So we needed to take that into account, and we do. Um, number 14 uses um, IBIS data again. Uh, this is the prospective earnings growth rate. Okay, so it's the forecast minus the, the trailing historical earnings divided by the absolute value of the uh, historical trailing. So it's the, the percentage growth that you expect, okay, rather than looking in the past. And we've got a three-year metric like that also, the three-year perspective uh, growth rate. And number 16 is 12-month perspective earning yield. So again, put the... Um, the forecasted in there, and the 24-month perspective earning yield. And then number 17, we've got revenue growth, uh, which is just calculated off sales or, um, or, or revenues, depending upon um, what we've got available. And uh, that's different than earnings. It's based upon uh, a different accounting variable. Number 18 is the rate of reinvestment. 
Okay, so that's uh, just the earnings per share minus the, the dividends divided by um, book value. And uh, number 19, finally, is just the return on equity rather than the change in the return on equity. Okay, so, and you know the definition of that is just the uh, earnings per share divided by the book value. Okay, so we've got a number of different attributes here. Okay, so uh, the total number of attributes, I think, is uh, if you count all the A's and B's, you know, 26 or 30 uh, different attributes. Okay, and this is kind of an exhaustive list that we put together um, before we touch the data. Okay, now somebody asked at the at the break um, about data snooping. Like any time you do more than one sort or more than one regression, it's data snooping. Okay. But the key, and what I've tried to emphasize here, is that we need to control uh, the amount of snooping. So you s specify a set of variables at the beginning and don't go beyond the list, unless it's an you know, extraordinary situation where you just can't get the data. So that's basically what we've done here. So we specified, let's say, 30 different attributes. And now what we're going to do is univariate sorts based upon all those attributes. We're going to take a look at the performance based upon all those criteria and then come down to a smaller set of attributes. So let me, basically what I want to do is to show you a, a performance sheet, take a look at it, and then I want to at least use in words the, the two methodologies that we would use to, um, to actually um, put all this together. And when we come back on, on Thursday, I'll be more explicit about this. And I want to go through um, you know, more of these performance sheets. Okay, so let's um, let's pick one. Um, uh, let's let's go to maybe Malaysia, and how about if we take a look at uh, Dividend yield. This is going to be very hard to, to see on the screen here. I'll try to expand it as much as possible. Uh, it's an ultra small font here. So, dividend yield is exhibit 5D in the Malaysia handout. And this is uh, from 1989 to 1998. Okay. And uh, we've got all of these rows with uh, exactly uh, the sort of thing that uh, I talked about before. Um, all of the definitions. We've got, we've got quintiles for Malaysia, because there's a fair number of securities here. On the left-hand side, we've got equally weighted portfolios. On the right-hand side, we've got value-weighted <coughs> portfolios. Okay. This combines both the in-sample and the out-of-sample. And, and remember here, um, the goal of the long short is to make sure that the difference between the long and the short is positive. So you know, it doesn't matter if every single security in the buy portfolio has a negative return. That doesn't matter. What matters is that the securities in the sell portfolio have a more negative return. Okay, so we're going to be evaluating performance in terms of the difference between one quintile versus another, and we'll look at the um, we'll look at the uh, this quintile right here. Um, we've got number one and number five. Notice the difference in return is is quite impressive here. So this the first line is just the average return. So for um, the first fractile, the average return is annualized at 4.62%, whereas the bottom quintile is minus 9. And notice over the, uh, the period, the benchmark way on the right, minus 5.81. Okay, so over the period, the benchmark lost on average 
5% per year. However, Quintile 1 delivered 4.62%. Okay, so that's, that's interesting, just based on one attribute. Now, the other stuff to look at here is the difference between the equal weight and the value weight. In, in this particular case, it's pretty dramatic. So let's just shift over here. The performance of quintile one is 12% when we evaluate the securities. And uh, if we evaluate quintile five, it's minus 12%. So I actually prefer uh, the value-weighted uh, type of strategy. Um, and this is, is quite a dramatic spread. Right, so if we were able to implement a long short here, the sort of average return that we would have had would have been 25% per year with zero market uh, exposure when the market itself uh, had a minus 6% return per year. Okay, so, I, you know, um, that is, uh, is, is pretty striking. And if we actually go down and look at some of the other uh, material that we've got, kind of the, the usual stuff, the volatilities, um, stuff like that, um, take, take a look at the volatility. Um, so we've got the standard deviations. They're very large. So, the standard deviation of the returns uh, for our, our buy portfolio for the equally weighted is 46%, which is pretty high. And the standard deviation for the sell portfolio is 42. So you say, well, yeah, we got better performance with the, the uh, buy portfolio, but it's got higher volatility. But Let's be a little careful here. Let's go over to the value-weighted portfolios. Value-weighted portfolios are, um, they're, they're less biased in terms of overweighting small cap. And the volatilities are less. And notice that the volatility of the buy portfolio is actually less than the volatility of the sell portfolio. So that's kind of interesting, based on one attribute. And what about the beta? So you might say, well, this is just a matter of risk. That because one portfolio has got a much higher um, uh, average performance, it's simply because it's riskier. So we can look at the beta versus the market. We already know the volatility uh, isn't telling us that it's riskier if we think volatility is risk. But volatility is not a complete measure of risk. So the beta for the uh, buy portfolio is 0.94. The beta for the sell portfolio is 0.99. So the sell portfolio has got a higher beta and a lower return. And indeed, if you look at the, uh, the alphas, um, <coughs> so I can't even see the, uh, oh yeah, 17 versus minus seven. So on a risk-adjusted basis, um, it delivers even a higher, um, a higher return. So the alpha here on the buy portfolio is 17.78. Uh, is yes? When you're doing the uh, average return in excess of the risk rate for Malaysia, why are you using the US risk It's all US dollars. Everything's in US dollars. I, I guess I should have mentioned that. Everything translated into US dollars completely unhedged. So we're a U.S. investor. We don't, it doesn't have to be U.S. investor. It could be whatever numerary you choose. But none of this is in local currency. Okay. Um, so the beta is lower. Um, we've got capitalization numbers here. And uh, notice that the, uh, the average capitalization of the buy portfolio is less than the average capitalization of the uh, sell portfolio. So it seems like we're buying some smaller securities here. We've got uh, benchmark uh, performance metrics. So our buy portfolio is beating the benchmark 60% uh, of the time. And notice it's pretty consistent over, um, it's consistent 
over up markets and down markets. So it's 58% uh, in up markets and actually 63% in down markets. So there isn't a, a, like a really big skew there. Yes? When we were talking about the betas of uh, these portfolios, why wouldn't we also talk about the beta of the entire portfolio? Because we go along with the portfolio number one and we go short portfolio number five. So what yes. about that? Well, you can just read it right off. Um, the, beta, the beta of that portfolio is just the difference in the betas. Because beta is linear. Yeah. And, and indeed, you could get rid of, like this is a very small difference. It's probably not a significant difference. So effectively, when you go long uh, number one portfolio and short number five, you're, you've got a little negative exposure to the market. But it's probably not significant. I probably wouldn't even reweight that. If it was the US, I would reweight it. But in this market, I'm not sure I would. Okay, uh, what else do we see here? Maximum, positives, negatives. Um, this is uh, something that we need to take into account. So this is the year-by-year -year, uh, performance, and unfortunately we only have like one minute left. Um, the year-by-year -year performance, everything benchmarked at 100. So we start each one of these at 100. And what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for uh, Portfolio 1 to consistently do better than Portfolio 5. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. And in particular, I want to look for that consistency on an out of sample sort of evaluation. So when we're getting near to the end of the sample in 94, we've got outperformance of portfolio one. We've got outperformance in 95. 96, we don't have outperformance. 97, the year of the crisis, we've got outperformance is pretty substantial. And 98, we've got outperformance. So we actually uh, do uh, quite well uh, in terms of the uh, outperformance. And if we go to the valuated, it's even more powerful uh, in terms of um, the performance uh, year by year. Okay. So, so this is, this is a, a performance sheet. You know, I've got lots of these. I want to go through them. And, and let me get you thinking about where we're going with this. So we're going to look in great detail, attribute by attribute, to, to kind of understand how these attributes kind of separate returns. Okay, separate the losers from the winners. <coughs> Go one by one. We'll also do some bivariates. So we'll look at, um, I'll show you a few examples that are unpublished um, regarding looking at bivariate sorts too. But let's just think of a univariate situation. We're going through these attributes. We're going to pick out the portfolios that did the best and the performers um, that did the worst. We're going to have portfolios. Okay, and each portfolio's got individual names in it. Okay? And what we need to do is to figure out a way to put all of those portfolios together to come up with a final list that will be our buy list and sell list. Let me tell you an ad hoc way to do it first, and that is um, some sort of like manual score. So on a scale of one or zero to three, you know, if, <coughs> if, if dividend yield looks so good, then I'm gonna hit every security in the buy portfolio with a three. And then let's say I look at another attribute and it delivers good performance, but not as dramatic as a 24% uh, difference. Then I might hit that with a one or a two. It's ad hoc, but it delivers kind of a score for each attribute. And then you go security by security and add up their scores. And this is actually where the word scoring screen comes from. And then at every point in time, you sort by the scores. And you pick off the highest scores, and that's going to be the portfolio you're going to invest in next period. Okay, so that's a, an ad hoc way to actually do this, and actually a very popular way to do it. People sit down, they go through all the details like this. This sort of detail you can't get out of the regression with the three variables in it. You can get it on a summary basis for your final portfolio, that's it. Okay? Understand how each attribute performed through time, assign some weight to it with the score, and then resort. Now what I want to talk about next time in addition to that, simple now, is a way to use our mean variance optimization. 
So suppose we come up with, um, with three very good biportfolios out of our univariate screens. And we come up also with three really good cell portfolios. And they might not be the same attributes. They might be different attributes. So an attrib there might be an attribute that's really good at, um, at figuring out the losers. So we have six different portfolios. Think about, and we got data on these portfolios through time, right? Monthly returns for each of them. And the three buys have very high positive returns and the three cells have got negative returns. How do we put all that information together? And one way to do it would be to run a mean variance optimizer. Set some level of volatility, optimize, it delivers weights ex post in the data. And those weights can be carried forward from the, the end of your holdout. So think about, what I want you to do is to think about that exercise. So we get weights, and let's say we run this through uh, 1988 to 1995, okay? We get a set of weights for a level of volatility. What do we do with those weights to create a portfolio for January uh, 1996? and then assume we would re-optimize every single month after that. Think about that. So how would we get from the weights in your uh, assignment number two, assignment number three optimizer, just by feeding in different portfolios. Okay, we're feeding in three good portfolios and three bad portfolios. And we're gonna have, um, let's say, some restrictions on long and short, so that the shorts could not go more than 100%. How do, we, how do we implement a strategy with what comes out of the optimizer to try to build a portfolio that does really well and really poorly? So the spread between the two, um, the buy portfolio and the sell portfolio is very large. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do on Thursday. Okay, think about that. Okay, good. Okay. Yes. yes, we do, yeah. Okay, so any more questions then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's where we're gonna go, so, okay. Okay, so let me just continue here. Now it's gonna be hard to see. This is, um, this is the performance of all of the different factors put together. And it's gonna be hard to see, um, I guess I got a point here. Capitalization is on the left. Okay, and um, what we're looking for, the green is the top portfolio, the blue is the, the bottom portfolio. And notice that Dividend yield is right here, that's the one we looked at. And it's got a huge spread between the top and the bottom. Continuing along, we've got, um, these are the changes in FY1 and FY2. And they deliver a huge spread also. This is the revision ratio. It's got a large spread. Over to here, and this is the this is uh, not expectational. This is based upon simply the um, the cash earnings to price. Okay, so it's not looking forward. It's looking uh, looking back. It also has a large uh, spread. Okay. And um, all the way down to, to ROE. Okay. Yeah. This is percentage of periods with the benchmark outperformance. Yes. One of the I guess assumptions we've sort of been, or at least I've been laboring under, is that if we have, if we do a graph like that and we look at each factor and we say we're going to just create a univariate portfolio, you know, basically, you know, dividends or whatever, and you know, <coughs> buy the big ones, sell the small ones. What about if you took it a step further and said, well, if you, if you have that kind of analysis and you just took, 
wanted to just to buy the single best portfolio, regardless of what factor it was, and then sold the single worst portfolio, regardless of what factor it was. Is there a value add there? I mean, because you're basically, again, laying off risk. And the only, thing, only problem I can think of is that you might have the same securities in both portfolios. OK, just rerun it again one more time so I understand the, the alternative. Uh, basically, if you took, if you look at these 19 factors or yes. attributes and found this, you can find the single best buy portfolio. Yes. And you can also find the single worst sell portfolio. Correct. But they might actually contain, they might have the same securities right. because of the different factors or attributes you're looking at. Exactly. But, well, but that, that's exactly the question that I said to you. Okay, so somehow, somehow we have, have to figure that out. Okay, so the question that I've got for you is, um, it, it might be that um, we could do this in an ad hoc way, where we, uh, we assign a score, okay? And it, it, it might be that the security that's in the buy portfolio and also in the sell portfolio for some other factor, it's just not gonna end up in the final buy portfolio. It's gone, it's out of there, right? So you could just have, um, you could simply look at the, the securities that are in the buy portfolio, in your example, that aren't in the sell portfolio. Okay, then, then you're done. And the same thing with the sell portfolio. Make sure the ones in your final sell portfolio are not also in the buy portfolio. Okay, so that's, that's kind of where we're going, right? But that, that's a real simple rule, right? That just says there's equal weight to the buy and the sell portfolio. Like, if I can get a spread over the benchmark of 15% for my buy portfolio, but um, a, a spread over the benchmark in a negative way of only 5% for the sell portfolio, then the buy portfolio is more powerful, okay? So maybe I don't want to weight those equally. So it's gonna be the case, in the example that I gave you, you've got six different portfolios, right? You've got three buy portfolios based upon three different attributes. You've got three sell portfolios based upon different attributes. You are correct that there could be, one security could be in all, you know, all six portfolios at, at a particular point in time. So what do you do with that security? Well, the, the problem I was thinking of though is that if you take out if you, if you lay them off, basically, and say, well, I'm not going to buy it or sell it, it changes that per the performance of that portfolio. Like, if you remove it, it's no longer, it might, I mean, if you remove enough of these things, it might not, they, these portfolios might no longer be your best and worst. Oh, but remember what we're doing. We're taking these as raw materials, and we're, tr we're creating a scoring screen. So a final portfolio. That's what we're doing. So given these inputs, let's create a final portfolio, which is our final buy list, or our final sell list. Okay, so it's creating the okay. best. Okay. Yeah, so what we want to do is to take the best for the buy and take the worst for the sell, for our final sell. I totally agree, you yank one out, it's gonna affect your fundamental sorting, but that's not what we want to do. Okay, so everybody see the problem? Okay, so I want you to think about this, as I said. And, you know, this, this is actually, um, Let's just go back to the overhead. Um, these are the actual uh, returns. What I showed you previously was the success rates. And I could have plotted just the spreads here, but I, I plotted the uh, top portfolio return and the bottom portfolio return. So you can see here, dividend yield was the one that I showed you. Uh, it's got this huge spread between um, the top portfolio and the bottom portfolio. And there's some factors that um, you know, have got uh, impressive spreads, but that one just kind of stands out, okay? Notice uh, even here, remember we saw the success rate for cash earnings to price was pretty impressive? Well, this has got a much smaller negative return than this, so a spread portfolio could be quite useful, okay? So you look for the difference uh, in these bars. But fundamentally, what we've got here is, uh, if, if I've got 30 different uh, factors here, I've got 60 different portfolios, okay? And each of those portfolios got firms in them. What do we do? How do we put it all together? Okay, that's, that's really where I'm headed, and I want you to think about putting it together. So think about, like, brainstorm, um, and as I said, you're not gonna find this in my research papers, because it's not published, okay? Talk about a simple scoring system. 
but I want you to think about translating those weights into something analogous to um, a score that can be used to separate out uh, individual securities. So we have a unique list for the buy and the sell. Now, I only have a few minutes left, but I need to tell you something that is important. Um, after you've done this exercise, you got a choice. Um, and, and you'll notice in, in some of the stuff that, uh, that I gave you that there's a, a, a final level of screening. And kind of uh, put together a set of uh, so-called knockout criteria. So even though we got a final <coughs> buy list, what will happen is that there'll be a search, uh, a news search, stuff like that, for all of the names in the buy list to make sure that we don't uh, have you know situations where there's like fraud or somebody going to jail or some irregularity. So even though this is a quantitative quantitative algorithm, there's some qualitative stuff that goes into it also. And the other thing I think I mentioned earlier was that. Um, when we get our final buy list for this market and final sell list, we have um, the top financial analysts take a look at the list. And they've got the, uh, the leeway to pull firms out of the buy list and put some in the middle up into the buy and to take firms out of the sell list also. So, they, so there is some actual qualitative stuff that goes on top of this. Now, how can you tell if they add any value by doing this? Yeah, you track the old portfolio. So track the purely mechanical quantitative uh, selector. And then if they're adding value, you're going to see it. Okay. My experience is that some, some value is added. Because we're just not tracking everything, especially like recent news. The key thing, as I said, is to put this together. We could do it right now. We could do it simply by assigning scores. Okay? So I could take a look at those attributes, knock a whole bunch of them out that I showed like in, in the graph. Knock a lot of them out, saying they're just not separating returns. Focus on a few of them, and then assign some scores. Okay? Does everybody see how that would work? So dividend yield just works incredibly well. So assign all the stocks in the top dividend yield portfolio a score of three, let's say. But there's some other factor that doesn't work that well, uh, but it does an okay job. Assign every single stock in the top portfolio a one. And then I got something like price to cash earnings that does a great job of identifying really potentially poor performers in the future, assign it. Stocks there, a negative three. Okay? And then for every point in time, for every single uh, stock, I've got a set of scores. Okay? And it might be that it's not scored. Okay, does, stock might not fit into the top portfolio or bottom portfolio, it just gets a zero. Or it might actually fall into the top portfolio three times and get a very high positive score. So think about the mechanics of how this works. And think about this in terms of um, uh, the optimization. So that's kind of like your, your assignment uh, for Thursday. It doesn't have to be handed in, but, <laughs> but think about it. Because once you get this, then you really get uh, how to do the stock selection. OK, good.